Uh, so it's a few minutes past the hour, so we'll get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm glad to see such a big audience today. This is, uh, this is exciting. This is great. Um, this is the third or fourth sea ice talk now in the, the IGS Global Seminar Series. Uh, if you don't know, we're trying to add one sea ice talk per month um, just to sort of round out the full cryosphere picture for this uh, fantastic seminar series that Tavi and uh, Magnus have been running for the last two years. Uh, today, we have Will Hobbs from Tasmania presenting on Antarctic sea ice. And we've had a last minute change of plans. Uh, Vishnu was no longer able to make the, the presentation today. So Louisa from Germany is filling in sort of last minute pinch hitting here for us. Um, Louisa recently defended her PhD at Avi on uh, sea ice dynamics and sea ice thickness. Specifically, she did a bunch of really cool work during the Mosaic project. And so Louisa has been kind enough to agree to give uh, a presentation on her work today. So we'll pass it over to Louisa. Uh, we'll save questions till the end of her talk. If you do have questions, feel free to drop them in the comment or the chat bar or wait till the end and just raise your hand and I'll call on people one by one. And with that, I will pass it over to Louisa. Great, uh, thank you. Let's do the sharing again. So I hope you all see my um, slide, my first slide. That is a, actually a beautiful picture um, of a lead. And yes, actually, uh, those. Uh, the, this is actually already giving you a, a rough idea what the main topic of my talk is going to be. That is uh, sea ice uh, divergence, and that creates those yeah slightly chaotic but still very interesting uh, sea ice landscapes that you can see here on this photograph. Um, and um, uh, um, uh, related to um, its effect on the sea ice mass balance. And um, today in this talk, I would like to uh, yeah, sh show you a bit how relevant uh, the sea ice divergence can be for the sea ice mass balance and give you also some hints how this process may actually change in, yeah, in the new Arctic with a much more seasonal ice coverage. Let's start with the basics. Um, this schematic here shows sea ice deformation in a nutshell. Um, when there is this convergence, the sea ice um, yeah, flows collide and form pressure ridges. And when the opposite is taking place, when there is divergence, they move apart from each other and leave open water behind. In winter, new ice formation can grow much faster and Uh oh, it's not a good sign. Damn. Yeah, there was I, already some choppiness before that turn. Yeah, it was a little choppy, so. Oh, looks like she's coming back on. Do you hear me? Yes, you're back now. I maybe. Do you maybe hear me, you guys? Wanna, yeah, it was a little choppy. Maybe, do you want to? Try presenting with your uh, camera off. Can you still hear? Me? Okay, I think I heard something from you, Dave. Um, yeah, you're maybe back now. you could repeat your suggestion. Yeah, you were a little choppy just before you cut out. Maybe do you want to turn off your camera? That might uh, clean it up a bit. Yes. Wait, of course. Maybe that helps. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, looks like there is also some deformation here in the internet connection. <laughs> but yeah, we're used to some hiccups here. So, um, okay. Uh, let's return to our uh, picture here of our schematic of the deformation. Um, I was starting to introduce a bit to the second process when, when there is sea ice divergence and we have uh, leads forming. 
And in those leads, um, we have a lot of um, new ice formation in winter. And it is um, much more efficient new ice formation than in the surrounding thicker ice because we have a, a much um, yeah, faster heat exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. And of course, the sea ice in those leads is still formed thermodynamically. However, because the process that created those leads is uh, dynamically driven, I still refer to it as um, yeah, divergence induced new ice formation and count it as part of the dynamic thickness change. And um, yeah, let's look how those processes could actually change in a in an Arctic with a thinner sea ice and with a, a more seasonal sea ice coverage. This is here again another schematic that tries to illustrate the, the relationship between thinner ice that we have now in the Arctic and the um, deformation processes. So simplified speaking, the ice thickness determines the mechanical strength of the ice and consequently also the thinner ice is easier to break and to move. And of course, um, therefore it is also expected that it experiences more deformation events and that leads us then to a more fractured ice pack. However, uh, as you just saw in the schematic before, those deformation events themselves also have an effect on the ice thickness. So it's more a circle than just a one-way relationship. And on the one side, a more fractured ice pack can lead to a more rapid ice thinning, especially in summer. And on the other side, the increase in deformation events can also dynamically actually increase the ice thickness. And uh, today I will focus on this negative feedback loop that includes um, yeah, two processes that we just saw at the beginning. First of all, we have the convergence um, induced thickening when we have yeah, more ridging. And second, in winter, we have those divergence induced new ice formation in leads with a positive contribution to the sea ice mass balance. And uh, one of the big questions is, of course, now whether those processes can somehow regionally stabilize a bit the CS thinning and how much they actually contribute to the CS thickness. And uh, yeah, especially this second part, the, um, this part of the new ice deformation and new ice um, formation in Leeds is uh, the aspect that I would like to show you today in this talk here because we don't have time for everything. And um, yeah, I wanted to go into details into this uh, one question and that is then the main aim that is to quantify and to also understand the divergence induced new ice formation. And in other words, when we look at this pie chart here, I wanted to estimate uh, the magnitude of the uh, of the dynamics um, in relationship to the thermodynamics to understand whether this process is actually important enough to to make any changes in, in the future CS thickness development. So where, when, and how did we analyze this um, this question? Um, we looked at the um, mosaic ice. Uh, the mosaic drift track that is uh, shown here in the teal colors and um, yeah mosaic is the acronym for the multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of the arctic climate and it was an international arctic research campaign that probably the most of you are aware of during which the icebreaker polage then drifted passively with the ice and the transpolar drift for the course of one year so this gives us a really nice Lagrangian data set that covers um, yeah, those 11 months and um, is uh, showing us the sea ice thickness during different seasons and also in different dynamic regimes. Overall, the dynamics were rather balanced. So we had um, yeah, more or less um, um, more of the same amount of, of, of convergence and di divergence, especially in the beginning of the drift. Of course, then when we approached um, the, the sea ice edge, there was more and more dynamics taking apart um, the whole flow in the end as well. Yeah, and uh, now the how is, is still missing. Um, we analyzed the, the sea ice thickness by the help of electromagnetic induction sounding surveys with which we detected the snow and the ice thickness. And um, with them, we could actually then um, yeah, show, uh, look at the, uh, the thermodynamic and also the dynamic thickness changes of the ice through um, all the seasons. And here in this pictogram, um, you see, first of all, the sea ice thickness uh, in fall. So the ice was rather smooth with some overfrozen melt ponds, a few leads, and some ridged uh, second year ice. 
And then over the winter, the thermodynamics clearly dominated um, over the dynamic growth with a thickness increase of about one meter. In spring, the situation reversed completely and the dynamic thickness change actually dominated. And we had a lot of leads formation, a lead formation and um, the enriching again. In total, when we sum up those numbers here now, um, we had a thermodynamic growth of about a meter, while we could attribute um, 40 centimeters to the dynamics. And if we think back now to this original question, that was first of all to quantify the, uh, this process, then we can now attribute 30% of the total thickness um, gain to the dynamics. And um, most of this dynamic thickness increase took actually place in spring. And uh, that is actually quite interesting because during this time, the ice pack was rather mobile and unconsolidated, and we had more divergence than convergence. And nevertheless, there was this um, yeah, strong dynamic thickness change over this even shorter period of time than we had here in, in the winter. And overall, that was quite surprising to us. And that's why I'd like to show you a few details about exactly this time period. So um, here is an ice thickness distribution that is um, basically a histogram of the ice thicknesses showing on the x-axis the different thicknesses classes and then on the y-axis how often they occur. And those two histograms uh, give you the ice thickness um, in late winter, so in this first pictogram and then in early summer in the second pictogram. And um, we know from um, buoy observations that the thermodynamic growth and melt was balanced. So um, all the changes that you can see between those histograms are related to the dynamics. And um, the, those differences are plotted here in, in the second um, graph. And um, yeah, here uh, we can actually split the changes into two parts. First of all, we have the increase in the thicknesses um, beyond two meters. And they, this increase, of course, is related to the different ridges um, that were forming um, um, yeah, in, in the ice. However, this material for the ridge formation, of course, uh, needs to come from somewhere. And um, the most obvious uh, source for this ice is, of course, the, the surrounding level ice that is there. And we see a strong decrease of this um, level ice here in this range of about uh, 1 meter 60 to 2 meters. However, if you sum up um, this loss of ice that we can see here in this lilac circle, then it is not enough to explain actually the increase in, in the thicker categories. So there is actually um, ice that, that was, uh, so we need ice that was um, formed um, after our survey but was ridged right away into the ridges before we had the second survey. And um, this means that uh, there was, yeah, that this ice uh, that can explain this increase in thickness was actually not yet existing in late winter, but must have formed uh, in between. And our conclusion here was that the main source of this ice volume gain were actually leads in which new ice formed that was then, yeah, reached right away. In other words, this divergence induced new ice formation was really the key process to increase our thickness here. And uh, this result is actually well supported by the observations of the dynamic drift regime. And uh, so the deformation indicated that there were several lead formation and closing events during the time. And in addition, sub daily motion, so mainly tides, increased also the intensity of, of uh, the motion. And um, this can actually be a quite um, efficient mechanism of new ice formation and subsequent ridging when you think of, of um, just tides opening and closing the leads um, on a daily base. Um, yeah, and uh, with those ice thickness distributions, so not only the ones for late winter to, to, um, to early summer, but also for all the other seasons, we could um, yeah, clearly attribute now uh, the, the different um, um, thickness classes that participated in the ridging and also in the dynamic thickness increase. So yeah, our key result here was clearly that leads play a really important role. And of course, um, yeah, the second aspect was that we could finally attribute um, now a, a number to the to the thickness change. So we found that um, overall the 
the directions induced noise formation um, played um, a quite large role because it could contribute 30% to the to the new ice and to the overall thickness change. And um, that's why we concluded on, on this um, point that um, they are really um, regionally an important process. And thanks to the regionally higher resolution as thickness observations that we had over such an extended time period and space as the mosaic data set presents we could provide a quite a robust estimate for this process here since this process is active in winter and has a significantly large enough um, share so those 30 percent it is therefore also relevant for the future development of the arctic thickness at least that's why we anticipate and um yeah, with potentially higher deformation, with deformation rates in the Arctic in a more seasonal ice pack, the divergence induced noise formation has probably also the potential to mitigate at least regionally the ongoing um, thermodynamic sea ice thinning. That's why it is incredibly important that we really understand those processes and represent them well in our sea ice models. And um, we hope that with the ice thickness distributions from mosaic we can uh, clearly then also advance our knowledge in this respect so what we found and found most important is that we had this large rather large contribution not in a in a dynamic regime where we had a lot, lot of convergence but rather in one where we had this mobile and uh, locally even divergent drift regime and uh, that this actually then favored this this process of the divergence induced new formation and we yeah, with this rather um, large contribution and um that is of course um and then the second aspect um that uh tides or other subdural processes um, may actually also contribute here and and be an efficient mechanisms. And um, yeah, therefore, uh, we said that it's really important that we improve our leaf fraction products to come up with really um, accurate estimates of those leads to get also um, not only this, this regional and and um, yeah like one year perspective of music but uh, detect whether there were any changes in the um, yeah in the in, on the longer run and especially how this process might then may then also develop in the future and um, that's why at this point I would like to uh, yeah already give you a short outlook of my current work because I decided to concentrate a bit more on those leads and um, they can detect be detected with several methods of course uh, you all probably know many of them passive microwaves thermal infrared altimetry or SAR backscatter uh, methods but what is less frequently used but directly connected to the formation process of the leads is um, deriving lead fractions actually from divergence and that's what i have done in the last month and um, i would like just to give you a quick look uh, how this looks like so i use sequential SAR scenes from which i calculate cis drift and then also divergence and here on this image you see um polar stern or the mosaic flow in the center and then two leads that have formed um in the proximity of polar stern and from uh, november 1st to november 2nd and then um I try to to reproduce this opening um, with the divergence and this is seen here on the second plot and um, here you see the overlaid um, uh, divergence on the SAR data and uh, the divergence is filtered and drift corrected and indicates actually and the location of this larger lead here in, in the bottom uh, really well. And um, we also checked whether the uh, the widths of the lead is represented well by, by checking the values of the divergence and, and just manually measuring the lead. And uh, that was also um, fitting quite well. So uh, we concluded that the, the leads that, um, yeah, derived from divergence are actually um, able to reproduce the location and also the widths of the leads. Of course, there are some, some still some issues that we are working on, for example, noise, <laughs> and um, so there is some work left. Uh, but overall, yeah, I wanted to come back to the uh, to the main conclusions here on this work and add here 
one point that the uh, divergence-based lead fractions are actually a good step forward, um, but of course they still need further adjustments, and that is uh, one of the projects that I'm currently working on. And maybe you have some yeah, ideas and insights uh, about it that you would like to share with me, then I'm really happy to discuss them. Great. Thanks, Louisa. That was fantastic. Um, we'll open it up to any questions or any uh, insights as Louisa ended with there on detecting leads. Yes, Roger. Yep. Thanks very much, Louisa, and uh, congratulations on just defending your PhD. <laughs> well done. Thanks. <laughs> uh, um, I had two questions, but uh, very pleasingly, you got to the second one during the talk, which was ground truthing with any satellite or any other visual images um, to get an idea of precisions and so on. Just going back to your thickness measurements, I just wondered what sort of r vertical resolution you needed, you expected, you got from those mm -hmm. um, height measurements. Yeah, slide six. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, it, like we assume that the um, electromagnetic induction survey method in general has an accuracy of about 10 centimeters over level eyes, but over ridged eyes, uh, there might be some larger uncertainties due to yeah the larger porosity of the ridges. Overall, like averaged over um, larger um, um, range Ranges, um, it is um, for the mean for sure also um, in, in a range of about 10 centimeters to accuracy. Smashing, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Marin, we'll go to you. Thank you, and congrats for me as well on defending. Um, the um, SAR imagery that you showed. Um, how wide a lead does it need to be until you can detect it from your divergence method in this when you've got drifting ice as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so you can um, compare maybe the, the uh, yellow circle, the larger lead <laughs> and the smaller yeah. one um, here. So you can already see that on this on the smaller one on the lilac circle that we only have a few pixels. So it's not really really well represented this lead and uh, the this the smaller lead is about 250 meters wide uh, wide while the larger lead has a width of about 350 meters so um we have not yet tested it for all the data sets but i assume that the yeah that the line is somewhere in between uh, yeah roughly at 300 meters probably yeah, follow up to that. Would that work better when your ice is not drifting? So in fast ice, would you improve your resolution? Um, actually not, uh, because I'm um, so I, I'm like the the I think the the reason for this this yeah point there is that um, that is the input resolution of the satellite images. So and that is for us here with Sentinel one uh, forty to fifty meters. And um, yeah, we, we would need a better um, resolution in in the pit here to to increase our um, to uh, to to increase the spatial resolution that we can resolve. And also, it would be interesting to see whether we can resolve any leads in fast ice, because we need this direct differential motion to 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 have the lead formation. So we wouldn't be able to uh, to resolve any leads that are um, created by other like I mean then but then it's a pulling how do you have those leads and, and fast ice tidal cracks if, tidal you, if cracks. you move around um bits in your coastline you get tidal cracks and then lead formation ah, okay and then okay good yeah that okay when the ice is I think still moving then we could re still, re still resolve it but the question would be whether we have enough satellite images to resolve those tidal um, cycles yeah. and i'm afraid uh, like probably not <laughs> the, the the point where i always end up is there's just not the picture where i want it thank you very much yeah <laughs> interesting uh petra we'll pass it to you 
Yes, thanks everyone. Thanks, Teresa. <clears throat> I was wondering, um, this seems to be like a, a 4D problem, um, how you uh, uh, in Mosaic supplemented um, the data collection with autonomous instrumentation buoys and the very satellite sensors, and if you can give an outlook uh, how regionally and seasonally across the Arctic Basin um, you can uh, make a statement about this volume or uh, mass balance um, changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. To the deformation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I tried to split this question in two parts. So um, it, the thermodynamic growth was uh, was quite well measured with the um, with the ice mass balance buoys that were deployed during Mosaic, and also of course other means like the transect measurements, but that was uh, not autonomously. Um, so the thermodynamic growth um, was captured by, by those means quite well. Uh, but then, of course, uh, the dynamics were um, observed also with the buoys. And actually, in the study that I just presented a few results of, we also used the buoys to characterize the drift regimes. Um, so there was this uh, quite large network of, of drifting buoys um, for the, yeah, to, to um, have a better idea of, of the um, sea ice deformation. Um, however, that still doesn't really give us um, a whole a, a picture for the whole Arctic. So um, for the for really covering the whole Arctic, I think that sea, uh, satellite measurements are still our our best um, way to characterize it. So um, with yeah sensors like Cryosat two that give us an idea of the sea ice thickness, and then uh, for the the ice dynamics, there are probably different ways how you could approach it. So either you do a, um, a, a, a gate approach, like for example, a recent study from Robert Ricca, he kind of estimated the, the dynamics and the thermodynamic um, contributions on, in an Arctic wide perspective from, from yeah, defining gateways and then looking at how much ice is drifting through them. Or um, I think there is now recently a, a study in, in the cryosphere discussion um, and they used the polar pathfinder product to estimate the sea ice dynamics to get an idea on yeah, this component. Um, does that help you, Peter, for some? getting some ideas. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I was wondering if you had gone and basically artificially received UI arrays uh, using satellite data and um, had satellite uh, mosaics or polar stands with buoys drifting, you know, for the through the different seasons or something. But yeah, that's great. And just for Maran, we have done something with the tidal cracks. Um, uh, we used at the end Terrasa and um, Landsat Oli imagery, and we got just quite good results to identify the cracks in the fast ice in Antarctic waters. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Petro. I've seen them in Landsat, and they're really great. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, um, Petra, like we have like this deformation data set um, in, in, yeah, about the distance of 100 to 200 kilometers around Polarstern for this, this time series now from, from the Sentinel 1 SAR seams. But um, and and also the buoy network, but um, it's it's not yet, uh, yeah, calculated for an Arctic wide um, perspective. Interesting. You know, I've always wondered, I, I thought maybe some of the polar pathfinder data or comparable data from OCSAF or um, other groups, maybe it's just, it's too coarse or too sort of spatially smoothed to yeah. get at deformation rates within, within the ice motion products. But I'd be curious to take a look at that. I've made a note, I'll look that up on the cryosphere. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's I, I think we are now learning a lot about the different from um, formation products and or, or let's say from which CI drift products we can actually calculate really um, useful deformation data sets and I think we're still in the in a process of, of um, trying out and and for sure like the SAR scenes are, are really really good I would say but um, of course they still have their downsides um, for everyone who's working with buoys uh, they, they still um, they, they of course say and that's absolutely correct that the the lower temporal resolution of the size is insufficient to then of course to display to, to show processes like the tidal um, motion and yeah so we probably need to work on a product that has both 
high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so we're going to move on. We're going to switch poles. We're going to go down south with Will. But before we move, I just want to thank Louisa one more time. She accepted our invitation to fill in this afternoon on about four hours notice and uh, put together what I thought was a fantastic talk. So thank you very much, Louisa. Rounds of applause. Perfect. There we go. Thanks so much. Um, all right. So we will move over to Will. Okay, just checking everyone can see and hear me and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, I'm talking to you from Hobart, from Nipolina Aboriginal land, and I'd like to open by acknowledging with great respect the traditional owners of this land, the Muanina people. I'd also like to acknowledge the huge number of co-authors and the work that I'm gonna present here today is currently in review with the Journal of Climate, uh, and it was a, an effort by an awful lot of a, a fairly big multidisciplinary group. So although I'm presenting it, I'm, I'm really just the uh, show pony here. And so, yes, a, a change of location to the Antarctic, but also a change of scale from, from uh, sort of fairly regional to, to big scale. And we're going to talk about some work we've been doing on total Antarctic sea ice variability and whether or not it's changed. So I'm sure many of you will have seen, uh, can you see my pointer by the way? Uh, is somebody, yep, excellent. So many of you will have seen a, a plot like this, uh, which is just sea ice area anomalies of Antarctica over the, the satellite period. And many of these features will be familiar, uh, long-term positive trend up until around 2014, 2015, and then a very sudden collapse leading to the lowest average summer on record, which was 2016. It's slowly recovering since then, and then another collapse this last summer. And in fact, February of this year was the lowest sea ice cover on record in Antarctica. You can see the February average here where the magenta line is the climatological ice edge, and you can see huge areas of the Antarctic coastline were completely ice free. Um, so uh, I guess February was a slow news month in Hobart because we got a fair amount of media interest and, and we were approached to talk about this. And so a, a group of us got together to try and figure out what was going on. And what we very quickly realized that we, we weren't necessarily that interested in, in describing this particular events around the 2021, 2022 season. But when we look at this image, a couple, well, something pops up, which is that if you look at the variance for this earlier period, say up to the early noughties, the sea ice is kind of doing its thing, the standard deviation, the variability doesn't really change. But then in the later period, we're seeing not just these extreme low events, but extreme high events. And it looks very much like the variability of Antarctic sea ice has changed. And if you look at the standard deviation, it's actually almost doubled across those two time periods. So we felt that the more interesting question, at least immediately, was why and what are the drivers? So we've got, oh, excuse me, we've got a fairly interdisciplinary group, atmospheric scientists, oceanographers, and, and glaciologists. And so we cover all the bases. And this is gonna be a, a fairly quick tour through that paper. So I'm gonna, be, because of time, but we're gonna cover off on all of those. So we start by looking at the role of the atmosphere. Now on shorter time scales, even up to interannual or decadal time scales, the atmosphere is the dominant driver of sea ice variability. And it's very easy to see why. Um, uh, Louisa was talking about those small scale effects of divergence and sea ice dynamics. But on the broader scale, you can see uh, red here indicates less sea ice, blue is more. And you can see when you've got these, um, these winds coming off the pole, it pushes the ice outwards and you get refreeze because you've got this cold, dry air coming off the continent. And the opposite is true where you've got uh, winds from the equator or close to the equator. Um, this circulation feature here, uh, we'll come back to that. That's, that's quite prevalent in the weather systems and we call that the Amundsen Sea Low. I mentioned that because I'll be mentioning it a little bit later. Now, 
because of that strong relationship between sea ice and the atmosphere, um, the atmosphere has been closely associated with both that long-term trend and in particular with the 2016 sea ice loss. There's been quite a lot of papers around it. Um, but one thing that really pops out, um, hang on, there we go. So these are just bivariate distributions of summer sea ice and various um, metrics of large scale atmospheric variability. So Southern annular mode, that Amundsen sea low and something called zonal wave three, which is a, represents large scale meridional winds. And these are, are normalized. So the, the axes are showing standard deviations. And what you see is that that 2016 and the 2021 event, in sea ice, there are about more than three standard deviations from the average. And while we do see anomalies in those atmospheric features, they're nowhere near three standard deviations. Well, maybe the last year's southern annular mode was, but, but generally it's not quite as consistent. So we seem to be getting a stronger response from the same atmospheric anomaly. So something else must have changed. But to check that more formally, um, we do something fancy. I know everyone loves machine learning at the moment, which is just a fancy name for aggression. Um, but what we've done is, I'm going to gloss a little bit over the details for time, but what we've done is we've taken a whole bunch of all these atmospheric indices that are known to be closely related to Antarctic sea ice. So the Southern Annular Mode, the Amundsen Sea Low, Zona Wave 3, El Nino, or in this case, the Southern Oscillation Index, and the Indian Ocean Dipole. And we take all those indices for up to 12 months leading sea ice and build a, a regression model to see how well we can predict summer sea ice area. And then we fit that model, we calibrate it against this early period, 1979 to 1997. And so on the image here, we can see that the observed is on the x-axis, so that's truth and our estimate. This is the one-to-one -one line, and again, these are normalized, so we're looking at standard deviations. And what you can see is that calibration period, the black dots, our model does pretty well. And then we test that we have an overfit by this later period, 98 to 2006, which is these black crosses. And it retains similar statistic characteristics, similar skill. And we're even able to get some of these uh, extreme high events in, in 2002, 2003. So we're pretty happy with the model until we try and use it on this later period, post-2007, shown by the red dots. And you can see that the model really fails. Um, both the extreme highs and lows are not represented, and even some of the less extreme events. It doesn't really seem to have any skill at all for this later period. Now, we are aware that we might have overfit to one particular period, so just to double check, we refit the model, we recalibrate it against that later period. So we're artificially trying to cram the model to fit this later period, which is the orange crosses. Um, and it still doesn't really work. I mean, it's slight improvement, but it's definitely not very skillful. So our, um, the result is basically telling us that the sea ice response to those large scale atmospheric modes which used to be very strong and very linear, seems to have broken down somehow. And while there's a caveat that we're only using large scale modes here, and that linear models often truncate extremes, although we were able to capture 2002, we are confident that this response to atmospheric forcing has changed somehow. So, we're sort of crossing off atmospheric forcing, at least in terms of large scale modes. I am going to come back to that a little bit, though. And then because a lot of us are oceanographers, we think about the role that changes in the deep ocean might have made. So I know this will be familiar to many of you, but I'm not sure how many people are oceanographers. But the sea ice has a connection to the deep ocean because the polar oceans typically are, are characterized by a thermal inversion with freezing or near freezing water at the surface and relatively warm water down deep and that situation is maintained because in the polar oceans the water is dominated by salt rather than temperature as it is almost everywhere else in the world 
And so when you grow sea ice and you get brine rejection because some of that salt from the ocean water is purged, that cold surface water then becomes saltier and more dense. It sinks down, <clears throat> excuse me, and it entrains some of this warm deep water into the mix layer. So that's a, in effect, a, a heat flux that will melt some of the new sea ice and it places a limit on how much ice you can grow. And so Doug Martinson back in the 90s wrote seminal papers on this work. Now, that means that if you were to change the characteristics of this warm water, you might be placing a stronger constraint on sea ice thickness. We wouldn't see that because we don't have long-term observations of sea ice thickness, but it might be making the ice more responsive, more sensitive. And in fact, we do know that there is a very robust anthropogenic warming signal of about 0.2 degrees Celsius in this deep water. Now it's very easy, it's very, excuse me, it's very difficult to test this from observations alone, because as I said, we don't have sea ice thickness OBS, and we really don't have very many um, year round under ice ocean observations. So we go to our model for this. So we're using Access OM2, a quarter degree ocean model, and that's what OM stands for. Um, and this model is run forced by the JRA 55 atmosphere. So our control run is just our regular JRA 55 run, run from 1958 to the almost present day. So it should, and it actually produces a, a very realistic Antarctic sea ice. But what we've done is we've taken the ocean sea ice conditions from January 1978, which just happens to have a certain circumpolar deep water of about 0.2 degrees cooler. I know the color is probably not very intuitive, but it's about 0.2 degrees cooler. And we shift that forward effectively to 2008 and run the model with the atmospheric conditions from 2008. So basically what we're doing is running the model with exactly the same atmospheric conditions, but a cooler ocean. And our expectation was that under the cooler conditions, we'd see a thicker ice pack and maybe less responsive to atmospheric forcing um, and so a reduced variance. That's not what we saw at all. Um, and in fact, the model where you can see the black line is our control run and it captures most of the features of sea ice variability incredibly well, including the drop off in 2016 and last summer. But you can see that under that cooler ocean condition shown by the blue line, we get thicker ice and slightly more ice, which is what we expect in the mean state, but it clearly has no impact on the variance. They're, they're pretty much indistinguishable, except in that mean state for summer. So this is a bit of a head scratcher because we've already said that the atmosphere can't explain this change in variance, but now we're seeing a model that seems to be very slavish to the atmosphere and for which a fairly significant change in the deep ocean conditions doesn't change the sea ice response. So, I mean, that was a little disappointing because a lot of us are oceanographers and we really want the ocean to matter, um, but hey, that's our own personal bias but it is an interesting problem. So if it's not the ocean and it's not the atmosphere, let's have a look at the sea ice itself. So what we're gonna do is focus on more regional scales of sea ice. Um, and so these sectors are shown on this map. Don't worry too much about the colors yet, but we'll come back to it. And this plot here are anomalies of summer. So December, January, February sea ice. The black line is the total. And then we have these different sectors. And the two sectors I want you to focus on are this Weddell Sea region, which is this uh, magenta line here, uh, which is basically the South Atlantic sector, and this Cyan region, the Amundsen Bellingshausen Sea, which I guess is the, the Southeast Pacific region. And what we can see if we focus on those three lines the black, the magenta, the cyan in the early period no one sector really dominates the total. If anything, the Amundsen-Bellingshausen Sea is the, is the dominant one, but you don't really see a, a, a clear winner. And you also see this inverse relationship between the Weddell and the Amundsen-Bellingshausen. So as one goes up, the other goes down, 
than vice versa. Now that's recognized as, as something called the Antarctic Dipole, which is the leading mode of Antarctic sea ice variants. And Xiao Jin Yan wrote a number of papers about this in the, in the noughties. So this is a recognized mode. But now when we look at this later period, so from you know, 2005 onwards, you can see there's a real dominance now of the wet LC in, in the terms of the total. The Amundsen-Bellingshausen Sea really isn't counteracting it very much. It's, it's in a low state all the time, but that inverse covariance seems to have broken down. And we can quantify this by looking at the standard deviation uh, across those different periods. We've already seen that the, the total has this almost doubling, which is statistically significant. The Weddell has also increased its variance, but interestingly, not significantly. But the Amundsen-Bellingshausen Sea, the variance is almost halved, and that is definitely st statistically significant. Now, why would that Amundsen-Bellingshausen region have lost its variance? Well, when we look at this map again, which shows actual trends in sea ice concentration over the satellite period, that Amundsen-Bellingshausen Sea is the one region in Antarctica that has consistently lost sea ice over the satellite period. And that's not surprising. We know that this area is one of the fastest warming surface areas on the entire planet. And it means that in summer, at least, there is now relatively little sea ice overall. If you don't have very much sea ice, you can't have very much sea ice variance. And if you don't have much variance, you can't have an inverse covariance with the wet LC. So what we're potentially seeing, our hypothesis is that now this Antarctic dipole pattern, this compensation between the Weddell and the Amundsen-Bellingshausen has broken down because the Amundsen-Bellingshausen isn't able to contribute much in summer. I should say that isn't the case for other seasons because the Amundsen-Bellingshausen still has ice then, just not in summer. And that's why we're seeing these big fluctuations now in, in total variance. Now, if we revisit that atmospheric stuff, now, what would that mean for that relationship between those large-scale climate modes? Well, work by Richard Mateer and co-authors in 2015 formally demonstrate that the signal of scale modes, say El Nino and the Southern Annual Mode, um, are very strong in this Amundsen-Bellingshausen Sea. But the wet LC sea variance is much more dominated by synoptic scale, transient variability, weather, and less so by those large scale modes. And so that would explain if the Amundsen Bellingshausen Sea is less important for the total sea ice area, that would explain why those large scale modes perhaps have less skill in predicting summer sea ice, which is now dominated by the wet LC. Now, just to cover off a little bit on the atmosphere, because we've only considered large scale modes, but an open question then is whether synoptic scale variability has changed in a way that would explain this. So what we've done is we've taken surface wind speed on a grid scale um, from daily data. And for each month, you calculate some metrics. So the mean, the maximum, the daily maximum for each month, and the standard deviation as a, a proxy for synoptic scale variability. And, and from those months, we can calculate a trend pattern and the hatching here just shows statistical significance. And we can confirm, and, and there is other um, for more formal literature that shows this, an increase in synoptic variability in the wet LC region, which may have a reason why the wet L has apparently increased its variance. But importantly, we do not see much of a reduction in the Amundsen-Bellingshausen Sea. If anything, the Amundsen Sea Low has increased. And we'd expect that because we know that the Amundsen Sea Low has intensified, and that is closely related to synoptic variability. So the key point here is that while synoptic changes might have impacted the wet LC, we can still say that this, this increase, this loss of Amundsen-Bellingshausen variance is not related to that we're fairly confident that it is just because there isn't that much ice during that December, January, February anymore 
to contribute to the total mean. Now, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but I'm going to wrap up there. So in conclusion, we're arguing that the loss of Amundsen, Bellingshausen sea ice has led to a breakdown of the summer Antarctic dipole, not in other seasons. And that's increased the total summer variability. And because the Weddell Sea, which now dominates, has um, less relationship to things like the Southern Annual Mode and ENSO, those large scale modes now have less skill at predicting the summer sea ice area, which explains our empirical model. Now, there are some open questions. Um, this doesn't address the recent tendency to extreme low states. Um, is that a harbinger of change or just some kind of decadal scale variability that we haven't seen before in the satellite record? I've also noted that we have some caveats about our ice modeling. We know that sea ice ocean models are very slavish to the atmosphere and particularly surface air temperature. We'd love to have a model where you have a, an active atmospheric boundary layer so that those feedbacks between ice and surface air temperature can, can evolve more naturally. We don't have that formulation, model formulation yet, but I think that it would be the correct way to do this in a real world. And we are now forming a, a fairly broad multidisciplinary group to look at the impacts, because when the media asks you, what does this mean and why does this matter? We actually don't really have a good answer. So we're looking at things like the response of ice shelves, biogeochemistry, and the broader Antarctic ecosystem to increased variants. And just to finish off, this is this week's or last week's image from NASA of sea ice variability. And you can see basically the whole of November, this Bellingshausen Sea has been completely ice free. There is a fairly good ice coverage coming out of the Ross, but I don't know, man, it looks pretty thin. And I, I think we could see a, a pretty low year again, but that's a speculation. And I'll, I'll let you challenge me on that one. Um, so I'll finish there and uh, open it to any questions. Fantastic. Great talk, Will. Thanks very much. Um, we'll open it to questions again in the chat or raise your hand. Yes, Marin. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm interested in what you think about some of the theories that have been brought forward that the very long um, periods in which especially SAM and IPO have been in a particular state due to um, stratospheric warming, for example, um, has changed things like um, CDW upwelling and um, thus pushed everything into a slightly different um, state around the Antarctic? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So regarding to the IPO, so that's the intercadal Pacific Oscillation, uh, when we fit our, atmosphere, our um, atmospheric model, we specifically chose periods to calibrate and validate that were in two different phases. So we're not sure that we see much of a signal of that in terms of upwelling. And of course, the Southern Annular Mode has a very different preferred time scale. It's, it's much more on the weekly and monthly time scale. Um, it is possible that you're seeing a nonlinear change, but what we'd have expected, because on our ocean model, if, if, if it was really all about the upwelling, then when you cool that upwelling water down, which is what we artificially did, you'd expect to see some kind of change in the variation. And, and we didn't really see that. So I think it's an open question. Like I said, we do have concerns about the model being too slavish, but we don't really see any evidence that that upwelling on its own is enough to explain the difference. Okay, thank you. Um, but hopefully somebody's gonna do a more clever modeling study and prove us wrong. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, Marika. Hi, Will. Really nice talk. Um, do you have any idea why the synoptic variability in the Waddell Sea seems to have increased? Um, I, I, don't, I mean, you know, it's a long time since I was an atmospheric scientist, so we can maybe ask Marilyn. I know other people have looked at it, but we do know that things like you know, the Southern Annular Mode has been on a, a positive trend for, for many years, and, and that is closely related to synoptic variability. 
why that would affect the Weddell rather than any other sector, I don't know. I don't feel qualified to answer that. Um, but if there are any atmospheric scientists online who, who have a good answer, I'd be very happy to hear it. Maybe something to look into further. Anyway, it's really interesting work. So thanks for sharing. Thank you, Marika. We'll go back to Marin. Maybe a bit of a follow up to that. And uh, no different question. Um, I was going to ask about um, the length of the time period that you've been looking at with both your validation and your linear regression model. That was from the 70s onwards. Am I correct? Uh, yes. So we calibrated because that the satellite. Model. Yes, yeah, so we calibrated, that's all with satellite data. So we calibrated the model for 79 to 97, and then we tested it for 98 to 2007. Um, and then of course, for the later period. Um, so yeah, that is because, a slightly short, but that's the limit of the observations that we have. Yeah, yeah, because there is two papers out by Murphy et al, who was looking at CI6 at South Georgia Islands. Um, from uh, 1901 or something really far back all the way to now. And it does seem that um, the influence of certain drivers like ENSO, um, the, the strength in which they influence the um, sea ice extent there has varied over the time period. Um, so that might be something to look into in future once a model is actually better to reproduce this um, to see if that internal variability in the strength of the response is just a cyclic signal and not a change in state. It may be useful, but that uh, Eugene Murphy's paper, they're looking at the South Orkney fast ice record as yes, a proxy. Exactly. And yep. unfortunately that doesn't give you the summer sea ice. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that gives you winter really only. On. Yeah, it, may, it, it gives winter and I think it gives autumn. I, I think we found a correlation. So I think you're absolutely right. One of the things we'd like to look at is get some reconstructions that we can look at, place these things in a longer context. But the South Orkney Fast Ice Record, which is that Murphy paper, is probably not the way to go. Yeah, okay, thanks. Interesting. We've got a, a minute left. Alec, you had your hand up. Yeah, maybe just a quick, quick question then. Um, yeah, you talked a bit about we kind of showed at the beginning this this kind of step change in the variability in sea ice area, and then yeah, there was some discussion about the Amundsen Bellingshausen Sea, but I was a bit unsure if there was a an observed similar kind of step change around that same time period, um, in kind of the late nineteen nineties, or if, you know, I, I know about the long term decline, but but was it kind of similarly? Um, yeah, a big, big shift in the 90s. I can't quite remember. Um, I'm not sure that you saw a step change in the Amundsen Bellingshausen variance. But, you know, well, we did show that if you just take the standard deviation of the earlier and later period, there's a significant decrease. It's not so obviously a step change. Um, what I'd say is that, you know, we know that there's been this long term decrease, and presumably it got to the point where there was so little ice over that December, January, February period, eventually it, it just, right. there's just not that much variance anymore. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I'd need to think a little bit more about that. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, I was coming at this more from a, like, you know, in the Arctic, we saw kind of see 2007 as this kind of year of kind of a bit of a step change in terms of maybe how the yeah, CIC okay. and some responds and, you know, that, that kind of big extreme really kind of pushed it maybe into this kind of new regime and, um trend analyses maybe becomes less helpful yeah okay interesting um yeah i wasn't you know i'm, I'm fairly ignorant of the arctic um but it might be worth looking into then some kind of change in you know some kind of multi-decadal tropical variance that's affecting both poles uh, might be worth checking all right, great. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, just before we wrap up, I just want to plug next week, we have three talks by um, early career scientists. You can see the titles and affiliations listed here. So last next week is going to be the last one before we take a break for AGU and then a break over the holidays. Um, the seminars will pick up again in January. 
The date isn't coming to mind right now, but in the middle of January, we pick up the sea ice talks again. Uh, we have Robbie Mallet from UCL giving a talk on um, satellite altimeter observations of sea ice thickness in Antarctica. And then we have Patricia from Boulder giving a talk on the influence of aerosols on Arctic sea ice loss. Um, so yeah, with that, we'll wrap it up. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. And I hope uh, I hope everyone is doing well. And uh, if you are going to HU next week or in two weeks, have a great time. So we'll see everyone in January. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Great talks once again. Yeah, thanks again, Louisa. That was really great. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> I assumed you had a deck kind of ready to go there. You didn't like quickly put them all together. <laughs> Either yeah, way. that's very for the internet connection. I really don't know why why it broke together. I guess like now it's the time where everyone is is just streaming around me. So that's probably why. I was fearing the worst at the beginning when it started breaking down. So kind of glad it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> so that was great. Okay. All right then. Bye, Have everyone. a good day. Yeah. Bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>